Good day, listeners, and welcome to this week's podcast edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I am pleased to say that this week we are joined by President Thomas Jefferson. It's been a few weeks. We've been talking about books and so many things and live performances and things like that. So this week we finally got Jefferson to come back. Back into the barn. Yeah, we had great questions. We had questions from uh, uh, Mr. Jeff Woods. He's the one who, but he ended his letter with a, Jefferson slavery fossil fuels thing. Trying to cheer Jefferson up a little, yes. And we also had one from um, Tim Bryant. The Texan. Mr. Jefferson and you were a bit hard on him, but you did answer his question very well. And then we also talked to, or talked about a, a letter from Joe Mello, which was really fun. That was the letters. Hector Saint Crevacour, Letters from an American Farmer, that classic book of agrarianism that was written in Jefferson's time. You know, it's so interesting. I, I got started, you know, people always ask me, how'd you get into this? How'd you get into this? And as if it were my life's dream to dress up in tights. Yeah, it was. It was it? not, no. Oh. Uh, I was talked into it. And the first thing that I learned about Jefferson, and I knew nothing except that he was on Mount Rushmore and that he was a great man. The first thing I learned about him, David, was the statement... Uh, from Notes on Virginia, those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. And really? I, th- I thought, wow, what is that? I mean, look, that's weird. I mean, why are farmers the chosen people of God? What? Why farmers? Now, I, I get it intuitively. I come from an agrarian background, sort of. But I thought, that's a big deal. That Je- Jefferson's not saying painters. He's not saying philosophers. See, that's way different than my first not exposure. Saying, what was yours? Well, did you do you remember when the uh, Ken Burns Lewis and Clark of documentary course, yes, came out? Yes. You and I both were in Charlottesville at the same time. Now we didn't know each other. The big other. signature event that launched the Lewis and Clark. We Bison didn't know each other. Ooh. I knew of you, and, and ditto, I knew you were and there, ditto. and uh, both of us were there, and that was you know it was a big deal. But because I was there, it was like I've never seen Monticello. I got to go. So that was my first trip, and. You know, you drive in and there's that museum sort of in the parking lot area. Right, right. Well, that's where I started. So my first exposure to Jefferson was, what a gadget guy. He was a gearhead. You know, I mean, everything from all of this uh, surveying equipment of his to his sunglasses. And so that was my first thing. His is, little PDA, the ivory tablets. That you know, have... you, you think back and you you have this sort of common grade school taught impression of Jefferson, which is... Not really. Pretty shallow. And then you start to see artifacts and things that he touched. And Imagine if he had had a 3D printer. I wish I would have known then what I know now. It would have been well, you're, interesting. Well, you're still young. You can, <laughs> you can go back to Monticello. You've never anyway, been to Poplar Forest. It's a great show this week because Jefferson's back and he's these, answering questions. These letters are great. Um, one of them was a letter from someone we've talked to before, the, the Texas school teacher. We've never, I think, in the whole course of this program, talked about um, Crevacour's Letters from an American Farmer. That's a book now I bet you will be reading. And let's go to the show, except there are two things we have to do. You can go first. First, um, the cultural tours are filling up, but there's still room in each of the three. Number one, uh, Water in the West. This is a humanities book retreat out at Loxaw Lodge on the 13th or the 18th. Are you sure that that isn't I am sure. And the, that's 13th through 18th January, uh, west of Missoula. It's not a kind of blizzardy, wintry thing. It's a, like it's a winter wonderland. It's it's, it's like a you know, like a, a greeting card of the the ideal winter encampment. There's pictures on the website. Yeah, isn't you, there? you go to jeffersonhour.com and get all the details. The second one is the 19th through 23rd on Shakespeare Without Tears, backed by popular demand, and then on March 2nd through 12th, Steinbeck's California. Uh, headquartered in Monterey, so those cultural tours are filling. But I want them to, to, to be available to anybody who wants to come to them. So go to the website. Great Jefferson food, great com. wine. You don't want any leftovers. All comfort, no rigor. I can be way quicker than you. I bet you can. We want to thank those of you who have decided to support the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We need your help. We need your support. Mostly, we really appreciate it. And. If you go to jeffersonhour.com, you can donate like to the show or you can become more than a monthly we did a lot member of, of the 1776 Club and get uh, access to a bunch of extra stuff, um, Clay's essays, uh, oh, unlimited access to all of the past shows, years and years of shows. And I know that right now we're in the process of finalizing the uh, Jefferson 101 series as well. So It's like 113, more than yeah. 101. We did a lot of them. And then uh, we shall go to the show, but I do want to alert listeners that 
we had a visitor here from... Oh, uh, Bo. Yes, we did, from Virginia. Young Bo Wright. This is Bo Wright, who we kind of ran into a few years ago, and he, for a while, was our man in the White House. He was uh, in the administration, and we had several calls in it. He turns turned out, up. He decided to take a vacation in the West, and, well, we just couldn't help but sit down with microphones and talk to him. So that's coming up in the future. Let's go to the show. All right. And thanks for listening. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay Jenkinson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and seated across from me now is President Thomas Jefferson, and so good to see you today, sir. Good day to you, my dear citizen. You know, it's been several weeks since we've had the joy of conversation, and I, I, I so appreciate you coming in to speak with us today, sir. My pleasure, sir. I have a number of questions for you, sir, uh, on varying topics from, from your many listeners. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's hear from the people who matter most, the, the citizens of the United States. First one comes from a Mr. Jeff Woods. He begins his question by saying, I don't believe that the question before us is, can Thomas Jefferson still be a guide for our troubled times? He goes on to say that your world, actually Mr. Madison's, the checks and balances can still work. Those principles will not fail us, and they have not. Well, I think that's right, that a republic is, a, is an experimental system in which the people are sovereign, and the people then govern themselves but through representatives that they choose freely. And that government is meant to do exactly what the people have in mind. And any government that veers from the, the purposes and the ideals of the people is, is discredited at the next election. And we don't put any significant amount of power in the hands of any single person or any single entity. We diffuse it so that the Senate is not the House and Congress is not the courts and the courts are not the executive. And the nation is not the states that make it up. And the Tenth Amendment, of course, says that those powers not delegated to the national government belong instead to the states and to the people. So we have taken the sovereign, the people with a capital P, and we have given them a mechanism of enacting their will and taxing themselves and defending their coasts and harbors and distributing the goods of life. And they are in charge of their own destiny, but we have divided and subdivided the focal points of their decision-making into a range of different entities that meet at slightly different times and have slightly different protocols, different terms of service, etc. And that means that an idea must be debated and distilled until it's refined into something that really does reflect the will of all the people by majority rule. That's our system. It was devised not from our own brains. It came out of ancient uh, Roman principles as, as described by the philosopher and historian Polybius. We looked at models that uh, had found their greatest expression in England and the French uh, philosopher and political theorist Montesquieu in his famous book, The Spirit of the Laws, really laid out that set of uh, balance principles, checks, balances, separation of powers, etc., for the modern world. So we weren't op operating in a vacuum. In fact, we were going back to the to the time of the Roman Republic in 509 BC. But those principles served us well, and I don't think that they are particularly time bound. However, I will say that we lived in a three mile per hour world that governed everything. The pace of life was sluggish, to put it lightly, by comparison with the pace of life in your time, and our technologies were primitive. Our weaponry was rudimentary by comparison with yours. Our communication systems were either non-existent or exceedingly crude. So the stakes were the same in my world and in yours, but the technologies of delivery and the pace of life have changed dramatically. And as you know, my favorite principle essentially is that the earth belongs to the living, not the dead. The question that this listener raises of whether our principles from my time are still useful in your time, 
is a very good one for the people of your culture to debate. Let me go back to his question again. He, he writes, the Newtonian world of checks and balances can still work. Those principles will not fail us, and they have not. And he goes on to say, Woodrow Wilson, a president I believe you're aware of, sir. Yes. Woodrow Wilson and early progressives strategically chose to marginalize the old Newtonian check and balances and replace it with an organic Darwinian constitution. We are not Hamiltonians. We are all progressives. However, we still have the option to employ the old principles that have been designed to protect our individual liberties, although it would require going against 100 years of progressive politics, an out-of-control administrative government, and a political world based on identity politics. Well, I didn't understand all of that, and certainly I knew nothing of, of Charles Darwin or or his theories. But it, it does seem to me, in looking at your world from my 18th century perspective, that the executive has become exceedingly powerful. I worried about this even in the original Constitution. I said when I had a chance to read it in Paris that the executive was already powerful enough and that the tendency over time would be for the executive to gain more and more and more authority and power, and that really uh, greatly concerned me. And the only check on an executive in our Constitution is the quadrennial election, that the president must be elected every fourth year and stand for re-election in four years, and the articles of impeachment, which, as you know, have not been a useful tool in the course of American constitutional history. And so you need checks against uh, an aggrandizement of, of executive power. And from my reading of the Constitution, plus an examination of your history, I would say that you don't have sufficient checks against an executive. And, and currently, uh, if I may hazard a, uh, an observation, the main branch of, of government, the Congress, shows little capacity to check the administration. Uh, and, and that's not simply true of, of the current um, presidency, but of several recent presidencies. I think he agrees with you. He writes, the only way back to the founding principles is through you, sir, and the founding fathers. Your words in the Declaration of Independence captured the spirit of America and just government. Well, things have veered dramatically from our time, and the courts have not checked that. They could have checked some of that in the course of American history. And of course, there are mechanisms for the amendment of the Constitution and for calling a new constitutional convention or a revising convention and so on. Uh, those tools have not much been used in the course of American history. I would urge uh, the people who are listening, first of all, to, to study this, to know something more about what's at stake, and then to attempt to push their congressional representatives, their senators and, and congressmen, to be more assertive in promoting congressional uh, primacy in, in this culture. And I would urge people to be very much concerned about any executive of any party at any time that gathers too much power uh, onto himself or herself. He ends his letter by thanking you for these conversations and with a line perhaps directed more towards me, sir. He says, please don't come to doubt Jefferson as a guide to life. Mr. Jefferson could no more erase slavery, which he predicted would ravish our country, than we can end the use of fossil fuels, which might ruin our world. Again, that letter's from Mr. Jeff Woods. Well, let me say another word about this, if I might, because the heart of my philosophy, and, and this man says that mine is the right one for this country, the heart of it is, I'm sorry to say, somewhat mystical. And here's what I mean by that. I believe that our tripartite system of government and checks and balances and so on can work, but it only works where several conditions are met. Number one, there needs to be a very very high level of civility and mutual respect that the minority on any question needs to respect majority rule, which is sacred under our Constitution, and the majority must not be pompous or righteous or vain or hubristic, but must reach out to the minority and assure them that they are a part of, of, of the American equation and that their rights and interests are important to all of us, not just uh, to their own faction. Secondly, 
there needs to be an attempt always to find the common ground. You know, we share more than we disagree about. Uh, we never have unanimity. That's impossible in any population, certainly a population spread across distinct geographic and economic regions as, as our country is. But our goal should always be to seek common ground, to find compromise, to see if we can craft legislation that brings in you know, another 15 percent on one side and another 20 percent on the other side, to, to find the great center of, of not unanimity but of consensus that I believe will always exist in a, in, a, in a free society. And third, the third condition under which our system can flourish and without which it cannot is public education and civics. The people are the only guardians of their rights. They must be very jealous of those rights, but they must also understand their rights and understand the mechanisms that they can use to protect them. If you have an ignorant population or a population that turns away from civics into mere getting and spending, if it's merely a hedonistic population that, that, that mostly just wants to consume and entertain itself, then your government will inevitably veer from right principles, and the people then will not have the civic understanding or engagement to bring it back. And so you need a belief in majority rule as sacred, but not a righteous majority. You need civility and forbearance and respect and mutuality, and you need to, to try to carve out lively compromises that include as much of the 100% of the spectrum as you possibly can. If you don't do those things, if you don't educate yourselves and live by way of civility, Mr. Madison can't help you. Polybius can't help you. Montesquieu can't help you because the system is as mystical as it is mechanical. I don't think I've ever heard you refer to the system as being mystical, Mr. President. It's a term I don't particularly like because I'm a rationalist, but I, what I mean is that the mechanism alone does not guarantee success. Success comes from an understanding that we are an unusual nation with a unique destiny and that we have a common understanding of the love of liberty, of our search for equality, of our commitment to justice and due process, a, 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 an iron commitment to the Bill of Rights and all that they stand for and an understanding that we're blessed in a way that no other country in the history of the world has been blessed. And if we jeopardize that for factional purposes, we will have squandered a birthright that no country has ever had and perhaps no country will ever have again. Thank you very much, Mr. Jefferson. We're going to take a short break and refresh ourselves, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. And this week, President Jefferson has been good enough to answer listener questions. Welcome back, Mr. Jefferson. You too, sir. Our next question comes from a Mr. Joe Mello, and it's about a series of articles written uh, titled Letters from an American Farmer. Are you familiar with that, sir? Crevacour's Letters of an American Farmer, yes, I think published in 1782. What do you recall about it, sir? He was a Frenchman. He was a physiocrat. And, and by physiocrat, I mean someone who believes that all wealth comes from the soil. Uh, this is a French school of economics and, and social thinking uh, that I subscribe to, at least in part, and that says that wealth comes from the soil. So uh, you put one seed in the ground, 50 or 100 spring up, uh, you, you pair um, a bull and a, and a cow and they produce uh, calves, um, that this is the fecundity of the world being manipulated carefully by ingenious humans. We've domesticated cattle and sheep and goats and dogs and horses, and we have taken the medley of grains that one might find in a field in the Middle East, and we have culled out the oats and culled out the barley and culled out the wheat, and from South America have gathered the, the potato and the uh, maize, corn, and we've, we've concentrated the seeds until they produce um, a common culture, what in your time you like to call a monoculture, and that by doing this, one person is not only able to feed himself, but he can feed a hundred or a thousand. And this, this ability for humans to carefully manipulate their environment, their natural resources, 
has led to all of the wealth of the world. If you contrast that with a banker or a stock speculator, they do no actual work. They don't grow a single um, bit of protein. Uh, They produce nothing that the world wants. They simply manipulate wealth already having been produced by humans cooperating with the earth. So that's physiocracy or the the school of the physiocrats. And I do subscribe to that notion. And Crevacour was one of them. And he was he was here. Uh, as many Frenchmen were here during the course of our revolution, and he wrote a a, a well-known book, Letters of an American Farmer, which was published, as I say, during the war. Well, the war had ended, but the peace had not come. Uh, The book was published in 1782. Mr. Mello writes to you, sir, Mr. Jefferson, you once described farmers as the, quote, chosen people of God. One of my favorite dissertations on the impact of farming on the American identity is Letters from an American Farmer. Among my favorite lines is when he describes Americans as having, quote, a pleasing uniformity of decent competence. What say you to that, sir? I agree precisely. I did know him and I knew his work and and I thought very well of it and it squares uh, completely with my own philosophy, not only of economics, but of the ideal way for Americans to live. And, and he's right that 90-some percent, and it might be as high as 98, but it's certainly 90 percent plus of all of the American people when I became president in 1801 were self-sufficient farmers. Just think of that. So more than nine out of 10 Americans from Georgia all the way up to New England fed themselves, grew their own food, often made their own clothing, usually built their own shelters, gathered their own fuel from the forests around them. They were farmers who were self-sufficient. They were what might be called subsistence plus farmers. That doesn't mean they weren't producing for the markets. They were. The American people have a genius uh, for um, capitalism and and, and for producing commodities for the world market. And we had a lively shipping industry that was um, springing up to take care of all of that. But fundamentally... Nine out of 10 Americans in my time were 100% self-sufficient. They might wish to buy some ink that they couldn't produce. They might wish to buy a violin or some books. But for the most part, they could do everything they needed to do on what might be called the republic of their farm. And and their surplus then was sold, and they used the the surplus cash to buy things that they could not or did not wish to uh, make for themselves. On their farms, and, and that's what um, Crevacour is talking about: is a decent competency. You know, it, it really made me think, sir. You know, I would go back to the beginning of Mr. Mello's letter and him uh, stating your quote of uh, uh, "Those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God," and how often you and I have talked about your ideals for America. I was not familiar with this work, "Letters from an American Farmer." So I, after I read Mr. Mello's letter, I took time to find it. And I, I presented you, sir, with a, uh, some quotes from, from uh, the second letter in that book. And I read it myself and thought, this must be what Mr. Jefferson was speaking of. Would you, would you mind sharing that with our audience, sir? I'd be happy to. Here's, here's one paragraph from it. This formerly rude soil has been converted by my father into a pleasant farm. And in return, it has established all our rights. On it is founded our rank, our freedom, our power as citizens, our importance as inhabitants of such a district. These images, I must confess, I always behold with pleasure and extend them as far as my imagination can reach, for this is what may be called the true and the only philosophy of an American farmer. He also writes, The instant I enter my own land, the bright idea of property, of exclusive right, of independence, exalt my mind. Precious soil, I say to myself, by what singular custom of law is it that thou wast made to constitute the riches of the freeholder? What should we American farmers be without the distinct possession of that soil? It feeds, it clothes us, from it we draw even a greater exuberancy, our best meat, our richest strength, the very honey of our bees comes from this privileged spot. That must be what you had in mind, sir. Yes, and it reminds me of the, of the poetry of Horace from the ancient Roman world and also of Virgil, the author of the Ecologues and the, 
and the Aeneid. The point that Crevacour is making in Letters from an American Farmer is a, is a very important one. First of all, that land is essential to um, human happiness and human independence. And think of it, that's not true in the rest of the world. In Britain, the land's all been taken up. There's no free land. There's no surplus land in Britain, none in France, none in Germany. All the land has been divided and subdivided over generations and primogeniture and entail and all sorts of feudal land laws keep the land of the country in the hands of the few, while the masses either are peasant farm workers, effectively slaves, or they are a, a, what I call a canail, kind of an urban mob, and that sort of living without landedness, without roots in the soil, leads to disease and social conflict and so on. So the, the answer is land. Well, what country in the history of the world has had land? We do. When I was president, most of the continent was empty with respect to Europeans. It was a tabula rasa on which we could expand over decades and centuries, and everyone who wanted a piece of land would, would effectively be able to have one. So that's the guarantee of happiness and independence. But, but once the land has all been um, shuffled away, as in, say, Britain, then the government, by which I mean the people, need to devise ways in which the landless can also enjoy what Crevacour is calling a self-sufficient and decent life. And that has proved to be one of the great uh, problems, one of the great challenges in political theory. Thank goodness we have, just in my time, six million people um, clutching the eastern seaboard with this immense continent to the west. That meant for me that I could be an optimist because it, it, it signified that for decades, even centuries, there would always be more land in the West and the fundamental problems of distribution of wealth and opportunity that have, that have ruined European life would not be a significant factor in the United States. And, and let me say one more word about this, that the farmer in feeding himself and clothing himself and so on is truly independent. He is not dependent on entities that he can't control for his basic life. Once you live in a city, that's not true. Your food supply comes from some other entity. Your clothing is made by a, a tailor somewhere. Everything that you need comes from a purveyor, and you can't control all of those entities. You may not even be able to understand the institutional basis of some of those entities, and so it creates a whole range of dependencies. So the more people who can live on farms, the better. Or, or put it this way, if the whole system collapsed tomorrow and everyone listening to this program became entirely responsible for feeding himself, clothing himself, sheltering himself, gathering his own fuel, and so on, what do you suppose would happen? There would be social collapse followed by riots and civil war. If the country collapsed in 1803 while I was president, more than nine out of ten people would simply go about their lives cutting down trees for firewood, growing rutabagas and potatoes and turnips and wheat to provide food for the table, uh, using herds of sheep or cattle or goats to provide themselves with meat or milk. Those people would have been just fine. They would hardly have known that their nation had collapsed or the economy had collapsed because they were self-sufficient. And that's why I said those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. If ever God had a chosen people whose breasts he has made his peculiar deposit for substantial and genuine virtue. I was struck, sir, reading this, uh, letters from an American farmer and the images described and, and your dream, your personal dream of an American agrarian society. Well, it goes back again to Horace, the the, the, the the passage about the farmer by his hearth with his amiable wife and some modest wine that they're drinking and so on comes straight out of uh, of one of the great odes of, of, the, of the Roman poet Horace, but I certainly subscribe to it and I wanted to build something like that into my own life. Unfortunately, I was a, a plantation owner. I had a large farm, a production farm, and I grew something that nobody really wants or nobody should want, tobacco, you know, a crop that is ruinous on the land and ruinous to the people who have to work that land. I was always trying to emancipate myself at Monticello from dependence on tobacco, but tobacco was the most important cash crop 
in the American South at the time, and, and we found ourselves producing it even though we, in many respects, knew better. Uh, so that I don't ever put myself up as an exemplar of that Horatian, that Virgilian, that Crevacurian ideal. But, but it is a nice image, is it not? And it's one that we can pursue in, 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 in our farms. We were self-sufficient at Monticello, but we were also what would be called an industrial village uh, by your standards, and it certainly wasn't the brand of family farming that I had in mind for this country. Another uh, area that I know you've always had, uh, should we say, a soft spot for is, is educators, teachers, professors. A couple of years ago, you took time to answer a question from a teacher in Amarillo, Texas, a teacher at the David Crockett Middle School. His name was Tim Bryant. Do you recall, sir? Yes, sir. He said he got quite a kick of humor out of you wondering if he was a Federalist, if that helps you. Some sort of a Hamiltonian, yeah. I think, yes. He wrote us again, sir, and he writes, recently while reading a book by Joseph Ellis entitled The Quartet, Orchestration of the Second American Revolution, I read that on March 22nd, 1784, you wrote a report concerning a plan for the government of the Western Territory. In this report, you called for the end of slavery in the territory, no later than the year 1800. Knowing you admired the works of Thomas Paine, I wonder if this idea to stop the spread of slavery comes from Paine's assertion that, quote, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. In this case, settling the territory west of the Appalachians afforded an opportunity to begin a society without slavery. Southern politicians who followed you saw the expansion of slavery as basic to survival of the institution, but perhaps that mindset had not appeared in 1784, and America missed a great chance to limit the spread of slavery. Well, a good uh, and thoughtful question. Let me say that I was the principal author of the plan for the government of the Western Territories in 1784. I was a Virginia congressman at that time. This was just before I went off to uh, France um, as an American diplomat for five years. And we were trying to bring in Western new states on an equal footing with the existing states. In other words, we wanted to solve the problem of self-colonialism. How could we not subordinate the West as Britain had subordinated us? And so I spent a lot of time thinking about the conditions for equality in new territories and new states. And you can talk further about the, the plan for the government of Western territories if you wish. It's a very, very interesting idea where there would be identically sized square states all the way from the Appalachians at least to the Mississippi River. That would solve the problem of the large versus small states that had been one of the principal uh, sources of tension at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. But to the, the point of slavery, I put into that proposed bill uh, a provision that would outlaw slavery after 1800, that there would be no slavery in the new western states. I can tell you that that provision of the 1784 land ordinance failed of passage in the United States Congress by one vote. States voted as units then, so Virginia had one vote and Massachusetts had one vote and New Hampshire had one vote. It failed of passage by a single vote, and I can tell you that every member of the Virginia delegation, except for myself, voted to deny that principle. In other words, they voted to to allow slavery to extend itself into the West, I was the only one in the Virginia delegation that voted to, to, to keep slavery from, from crossing the Appalachians. And I wrote about this, and I said, Heaven was silent in this awful moment. Now millions of unborn Negroes will be enslaved to men they never offended through the lack of a single vote in the Congress of the United States. Now think of that, the destinies of nations are sometimes determined by something as small as a single vote. Again, that came from middle school teacher Tim Bryant, who teaches at David Crockett Middle School of Amarillo, Texas. In Texas. Now, I should say that in the, in the land ordinance, I created the cadastral rectangular survey grid system, the square miles and townships and 640 acres and 40 acres, the way that the whole West was divided and subdivided. If you took a hot air balloon over the country, you could see this perfect patchwork of rectilinearity that we imposed upon the vast wilderness of the American West so that things would be orderly and there would be no disputes over, over boundaries and so on. 
this was not my invention alone, but I was the person who was most uh, delighted by the idea of a beautiful, geometrically perfect rectangular survey grid system to replace the old meets and bounds system that existed in, in Britain. However, Texas, where this gentleman lives... They didn't quite follow your plan, did they, sir? They would not do it. They did not accept the cadastral rectangular survey grid system. And if you look at a survey grid system map of the United States, it works in Iowa, it works in Colorado, it works in Nevada, it works in Oregon, and the state of Texas is outside of the boundaries of human good sense. Pardon me, Mr. Jefferson, but I, I almost detect a sense of irritation. I am very irritated because order matters. And why should Texas be allowed to come in as a state without adopting the systems of orderliness and good sense, enlightened legislation that were prepared by people benign and, and generous about Texas. But Texas came in under its own dispensation. And did you know it has the right to secede at any time and it can divide itself into five constituent Texas republics if it wishes to? Well, now, Mr. President, we, we all know that Texas is a lovely state, and I do apologize for bringing this up and irritating you so, sir, but, but perhaps we could end on a, on a more positive note. Uh, perhaps Mr. Bryant would consider putting some of your views into his lesson plan, sir. I hope he will, and I hope that he will attempt to persuade the legislature of Texas to do the right thing in this, as in all other cases. Well, here's hoping we hear from Mr. Tim Bryant at the David Crockett Middle School of Amarillo, Texas. He can let us know how his students reacted to your answers and let us know what he's doing with your advice. Thank you very much. Right now, we need to take a short break. When we return, we'll be speaking with the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, the man who portrays President Jefferson, Clay Jenkinson. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Hello, everyone. It's Clay Jenkinson, just sneaking in a little announcement between segments of the Jefferson Hour. I want you to join me this winter at Loxaw Lodge, west of Missoula, for two humanities cultural retreats. The first one, Water in the West, January 13th through 18th, and the second, Shakespeare Without Tears, January 19th through 24th. For more information, go to our website, jeffersonhour.com forward slash tours. We'll see you in the mountains. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson, and now our weekly conversation with the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, and it is he who is seated across from me now. Good day to you, sir. Good day to you, my friend, the semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, beloved by many. Oh. <laughs> and wherever I go, people ask, where's Swenson? We had fun questions this week. Um... We started with uh, one from a gentleman, Jeff Woods, and, uh, you know, Jefferson probably couldn't respond to this, but I, I particularly got a kick out of this. His last paragraph, he says, gentlemen, thank you for your work. Our pleasure, sir. Please don't come to doubt Jefferson as a guide. Mr. Jefferson could no more erase slavery than we can end the use of fossil fuels. Is that a little too thick or do you take that? I do take that, but it also has to be um, resisted. In other words, we can say Jefferson was stuck. But remember, there were people in Jefferson's time who did free slaves. Also, uh, I wanted to revisit uh, Tim Bryant, the teacher. Yeah, Mr. Jefferson was a bit hard. Well, on I love to beat up on Texas because Texas loves to be Texas. You know, he works Mr. Jefferson's responses into his class. I just think that's great. And he ended by thanking you for the stimulating conversation each week. And I have especially enjoyed re-listening to the Jefferson Watch essays. Oh, how nice. Via the 1776 Club. I love writing these essays, I'll tell you. Tim Bryant, I hope you took Mr. Jefferson's criticism in the spirit, which with, well, then again, I can't really guess what Mr. Jefferson's spirit was. But. I was just having fun with Texas because Texas did come into, under its own dispensation. It can break up into five sub-republics. It did not accept, although it later adopted something like he wanted the squares. cadastral survey he grid was... system. And Texas is irrationally shaped. And then there was uh, the letter from Joe Mello about uh, letters from an American farmer. And I did, actually. I wasn't aware It's a beautiful book. This. Hector St. Jean Crevacour. I found it on Gutenberg.org. You can download it for free. And I read it and I thought... 
gosh, this has got to be what he was talking about. Of course, they they come from the same school of agrarianism, and but but one thing I really want to go back to, David, is is Crevacour's view that that farmers are equalitarian. That you have a big farm or a little farm, but what you have to do is produce enough food for yourself and your family. And so there's a fundamental equality about this and an independence of spirit. I want to read just one more little piece from uh, Crevacour's Letters from an American Farmer. He said, I bless God for all the good he has given me. I envy no man's prosperity and with no other portion of happiness than that I may live to teach the same philosophy to my children, give them each a farm, show them how to cultivate it, and be like their father, good, substantial, independent American farmers. That's what Jefferson had in mind. We are not that people. And even in our beloved North Dakota, which is a family farm state, it has a family farm protection law, corporate gigantism has changed the nature of agriculture fundamentally. And there are literally now people who can do farm business with drones with combines that drive themselves more effectively than any worker could drive them. We're moving into a world of hyper-industrialization using artificial intelligence and robotics. It's going to be great for production. It is not exactly the philosophy of agrarianism. Okay, well, look, can I respond to that? Of course. Two things. One is, and I don't think I'll get an argument from you. We'll see. If Jefferson knew about drones... He'd have one of everything. Yes, he would. He'd and have he them all. He would love that technology. Of course, no question. And, you know, I grant you that, that, that corporate thing, but, you know, it all comes down, and that's why I was so struck by that, that one passage that I read. It all comes down to um, the farmer, the family, the end of the day, your children there... Okay, they might not be reading books by the fire, uh, and uh, the missus farmer might not be crocheting or knitting by the fire, but it's still it's still a unique thing, and you know that. You, I have friends who are true agrarians. And you, you spent time on your grandparents' farm. That was another era, but yes. And uh, you spent time on farms in, in um, Kansas. And don't you think that that sense of independence still exists? I mean, even for me in my tiny little garden in the backyard, when I'm done and I sit out and look over it, I mean, there's a, there is a that Jeffersonian sense of of being even a little bit independent and not uh, dependent on the world. Of course, so. no, I'm a hundred percent with you that even our farming, industrialized, computerized, artificial intelligence farming, still has something of that deep, um, sacred quality to it that Jefferson was seeing. And I always say on this program and elsewhere that growing a tomato or a potato or a, or a cob of corn is a liberating and enlightening experience. It, it doesn't feed you, but it gets you into the zone of what it means to be an agrarian and to have your hands Uh, in the soil. Something we all profit from and shouldn't lose track of. But we are losing track of it more and more. So that little flame, remember Jefferson said, at the end of that famous passage, those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God, Jefferson says, it is the focus of that sacred fire which otherwise might disappear from the earth. That's a key sentence. Wait a minute, do that once more. That farming is the focus of that sacred fire which otherwise might disappear from the earth. That's great. Now that I, you know, I, can, I wish I could have said it that succinctly and, and, you, and expressed that much. But I feel the fire is might blink out as you get more and more and more removed from the soil, and a farm is merely an extraction device rather than a place where the farmer family is walking around raising sheep, engaged in rodeo, whatever it might be. Thanks to Joe Mello for that letter. Uh, it's a great it letter. Is, and it was fun to hear Jefferson respond to it. So before we go to this week's essay, which I'm excited to hear because I know it's about your recent trip um, to Yellowstone, um, I want to just take a moment to remind people that you have cultural tours coming up um, and uh, they can find out all the information uh, at jeffersonhour.com. Two Humanities Retreats, January 13th through 18th and January 19th through 23rd on Shakespeare and Water in the West. That's out at Loxaw Lodge, west of Missoula, a magnificent place. And then March 2nd through 8th, Steinbeck's, California, out in Monterey, the most beautiful part 
of California. So those are all on jeffersonhour.com. That's right, jeffersonhour.com. Uh, go to the website. You can find out all sorts of stuff about the Jefferson Hour. Um, you can read Clay's essays, listen to his essays, um, listen to the show at jeffersonhour.com. Uh, you can support the show. You can join the 1776 Club. And this week we've spent an entire program devoting it to President Jefferson answering listener questions. So if you have a question for President Jefferson, you can submit your question at jeffersonhour.com. And with that, sir, it is now time for this week's Jefferson Watch. Thank you, David. Seventeen years ago, my mother purchased a tiny cabin near Cook City, Montana, right at the northeast portal of Yellowstone National Park. It's a blonde log cabin, 12 by 14 feet, but with a sleeping loft. It was her idea. She loved that cabin. She spent about six weeks per year there, usually all alone with her miniature Schnauzer Boswell, though she had a few friends in nearby cabins that are better than most of our homes. She read a book a day. It wasn't Tolstoy or even Jane Austen, but still... My mother gave me that cabin two years ago, and she died this summer on July 9th in Bismarck, North Dakota. So I went out there this last weekend to close up for the long Montana winter and to clear out her clothing and other personal effects. I filled 15 large black garbage bags with things that no longer had any reason to be in that cabin, some for the landfill, some for goodwill, and a few for me. It was a melancholy business. Every item had been brought there by my mother over the last 17 years, perhaps the happiest years of her life, certainly the happiest zip code of her life. Things that I unceremoniously now tossed into bags had significance for her. A gift from a friend, a memento from a journey in the park, a book that she read on the deck of the cabin on a particularly beautiful summer day. If she had been with me last weekend and I had proposed such a purge, She would have fought for well more than half of everything I plucked off the shelves, out of cabinets, bins, and drawers. And by the way, she would have won those fights. And she would also have said, Physician, heal thyself. My mother didn't give a rip about Henry David Thoreau. I'm using her very words. She found him righteous and preachy, and she was never a minimalist with respect to material possessions. But her cabin is almost precisely the size of Thoreau's cabin at Walden Pond in Massachusetts. My purpose now is to make it as spare and minimalist as I can. This will come in several waves as I grow more courageous. My guiding principle comes straight out of Walden. In the first great chapter, Economy, Thoreau writes, I had three pieces of limestone on my desk, but I was terrified to find that they required to be dusted daily when the furniture of my mind was all undusted still, and threw them out the window in disgust. I love the principle, and I also love the metaphor. Thoreau's argument is breathtakingly simple, and 180 degrees out of sync with American life. His view was that if you actually asked yourself what you need, not what you want, and pared down your life accordingly— Not only would you get out from under the mountain of stuff that must be dusted or stored or shelved, not to mention paid for, but that with radical simplification of your life, your soul would be able to wake up and thrive. The burden of life is partly the accumulation of material things that we, as it were, carry on our shoulders day after day, year after year, thus preventing us from really breathing or seeing or listening to the dictates of our hearts and souls. My cabin is so small that there is no room for clutter. The dishes have to be done after every meal. Each of the few things the cabin can wisely contain has a place, a shelf, a cubby, a ledge. If you spent a couple of days not tending to this, you'd be tripping all over yourself. There is room for 250 books in the cabin, but not 2,500. There is a television linked to an ugly and marring satellite dish outside, but I never turned it on in the three days I spent there. The cabin can hold two sets of sheets, but not a dozen. The first day I was there, I cleared out everything I thought should go. Then I slept on it, and the second day I cleared out an equal number of items, though I had to stop and debate some of those things with myself and with the ghost of my mother's fist shaking over my shoulder. On the third morning, I cleared out still more, 
How many coffee mugs does one really need? Is that plaque that says what happens in the cabin stays in the cabin worth dusting? And wouldn't Thoreau say if you have to hide your life within boards and fences, maybe you need to rethink your life? I worked like Thoreau in the mornings, and in the afternoons I ventured into Yellowstone National Park. A week ago, on camera in the Badlands of North Dakota, I made the claim that our man Thomas Jefferson was the spiritual father of the national park system because, A, he wanted to celebrate all that was unique and sublime in the American landscape, and B, he purchased the natural bridge in western Virginia to make sure it was never exploited for commercial or industrial purposes. He told friends, including Maria Cosway, that it was worth a trip across the Atlantic to see, and in her case, paint, the Natural Bridge. Yellowstone National Park was created in 1872, 46 years after Jefferson's death, and 2,052 miles from Monticello. You need only imagine what Jefferson would have thought about boiling mud pots, geysers, clusters of browsing moose, or Yellowstone Falls. He got what he called a violent headache merely by sitting on top of the Natural Bridge in his home state. In his only book, Notes on the State of Virginia, Jefferson wrote, It is impossible for the emotions arising from the sublime to be felt beyond what they are at the Natural Bridge. Just imagine if he had seen the wonders of the American West, the Grand Canyon, the Redwoods, Yosemite, Glacier National Park, or Old Faithful. It's the sublime squared and the sublime cubed. My mother had favorite places in the park. I stopped at some of them to say farewell. Unfortunately, she was one of the millions who prefer to view our national parks through a windshield. On Saturday, I hiked a few miles along the Lamar River Trail. It was a perfect October day, and the park was essentially empty. Certainly, the trails were empty, and I could sense in the air that the long lock of winter is not many days or weeks off. The sky was perfect. The river was the bluest blue you have ever seen, heartbreaking in its beauty. As I strolled back to my car, a gang of 35 buffalo walked slowly past me to another pasture. They stared at me a little, and the bulls snorted just to make sure I wasn't going to do anything funny. The whole scene was what the distinguished Great Plains historian Daniel Flores calls American Serengeti. How can we ever sufficiently thank those who did this for us, Congress in this case, but Theodore Roosevelt above all others, and at the very beginning of our national destiny, Thomas Jefferson, who realized that American exceptionalism was in part the measure of the primordial magnificence of this continent. Imagine if Yellowstone had been developed like the natural bridge before the state of Virginia obtained it, or like Dollywood, or a Flintstones theme park, or Branson, Missouri. Someone asked me the other day whether I'm more enamored of Jefferson or Theodore Roosevelt. Jefferson by far, I replied. How about Jefferson or Meriwether Lewis? Still Jefferson, though my soul responds to the parts of Lewis that Jefferson could never appreciate. How about Jefferson and Thoreau? Well, now you have me, I said. In my view, Walden is America's greatest book, and Thoreau is the voice we most need to hear in an America that is now the world's leader in type 2 diabetes a land where people have annual garage sales to get rid of perfectly good things in order to make room for a whole new round of perfectly good and soul-crushing things, and where it is in our spiritual interest to be skeptical about global climate change because if we really took it seriously as a threat to the planet, we might just have to adjust our lives in something like a Thoreauvian direction. My cabin is now a better metaphor for my values than my house in North Dakota, which desperately needs a Thoreauvian sweep. I don't even know where the three pieces of limestone are buried there, and there are not enough plastic bags in the nearest Home Depot to contain all that I must slough off if I wish to live a life of true wisdom and integrity. In his chapter Economy, Thoreau says it perfectly, To be a philosopher is not merely to have subtle thoughts nor even to found a school but so to love wisdom as to live according to its dictates, a life of simplicity, independence, magnanimity, and trust. It is to solve some of the problems of life, not only theoretically, but practically. I've got some problems to solve, and the dust in my world is knee-deep. My hope is that Walden too, my cabin out at the portal of America's first and greatest national park, will help me to find the courage and the strength 
simplify. I'm Clay Jenkinson. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public Radio. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any past show for a $12 donation, please call 888-828-2853. Again, that number is 888 888- 828-2853. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.org and on iTunes. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.org. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at McCoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Music by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson. ¶¶